Welcome to Grassroots Health webinar series, Scientists Answer Your Question, a series of free webinars that are sponsored by the thousands of participants in the Vitamin D Action Project of Grassroots Health. For those of you who don't know what that is, please take a look on our website. We'd be delighted to have you join. Today, we are absolutely delighted and honored to have one of the greats in the field, Dr. Michael Hollick talk with us about the very latest research that's come out on vitamin D and gene expression. I do want to remind us all, as I have before, I'm still just in awe of the fact that we are truly living in a time where we have the opportunity to listen to and learn from the greats and the beginners in the whole field of vitamin D, and Dr. Hollick is certainly one of those. He has been researching and working with vitamin D since the early 70s and I have to smile somewhat because he's one of the few people that are not quite as old but almost as old as I am. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hollick, very, very much welcome and we're very excited to hear about the vitamin D and gene expression and it's all yours. Thank you very much Carol for that kind introduction. So I am going to give um, you a broad overview uh, from a new perspective about vitamin D and that is a recent study that we published um, looking at gene expression um, in otherwise would be considered healthy adults. As you're well aware vitamin D of course is either made in your skin from sun exposure or you're getting it from your diet but it's biologically inactive and it must go to the liver where it's converted to 25-hydroxy vitamin D. It's the major circulating form of vitamin D. It's the form of vitamin D that you want your doctor to measure to determine your vitamin D status. But it too is biologically inactive and it must go to the kidneys where it gets activated to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And what this hormone does, its major function throughout evolution is to control calcium metabolism and bone health. Indeed, it was shown many, many years ago, as you would expect, that the vitamin D receptor that basically interacts with the active form of vitamin D is found in calcium regulating tissues, namely in the intestine, in the kidney, as well as in the bones. But over the past two decades or so, it's now been appreciated that basically every tissue and cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor. And so the obvious question is, why? What would the function be? And some of the earliest evidence to give us an insight into non-calcemic benefits of vitamin D came originally from Dr. Suda's work back in 1979. He realized that leukemic cells had a vitamin D receptor. And he wondered why they did. And he incubated them with the active form of vitamin D. And when he did that, he found that the cells actually matured. And so this led to the concept of the possibility that maybe you could use vitamin D to both treat and prevent cancers. And indeed, there is a lot of information, and you've heard already from Dr. Garland, that there is an association with sunlight deficiency and vitamin D deficiency and increased risk for many common cancers. And other studies have shown that there's increased risk for other chronic deadly diseases. So what about vitamin D and the cancer connection? If you go into the literature and read it carefully, this gives you an insight to the, to the issue. Whoops. I think the computer is not going as fast as me. Um, Sunbathing could cut your risk of cancer. Indeed, in 1941, it was appreciated that if you lived in the northeastern United States, that you were more likely to die of cancer than if you lived down south. And the author, Dr. Apperly, reasoned that possibly you developed an immunity to cancer. And because often people that lived in the south had non-melanoma skin cancer, easy to detect and easy to treat, yes, 
they had skin cancer, but so what? Because they had an immunity to all other cancers. But we began to appreciate in the late 80s and early 90s by the Garland brothers that if you improve your vitamin D status, that you reduce risk of many cancers, including ovarian and in this case colorectal cancer. And it was concluded that just increasing your vitamin D intake to a thousand units a day could potentially reduce that risk by as much as 50 percent. Also a study done out of the Nurses Health Study here at Harvard when they looked at blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D in these otherwise healthy nurses, if they had a blood level on average of 48 nanograms per ml, they had a 50 percent reduced risk of developing breast cancer. The very nice study by um, Lappi and uh, Heaney several years ago in almost 1,200 postmenopausal women who received calcium supplementation as well as 1,100 units of vitamin D or placebo and looked at the development of all cancers over a period of four years remarkably reported that there was about a 60 percent reduced risk of those women developing all cancers. And because they were concerned that, well, possibly they may have had a cancer incubating in the first year, and so they took that group of women out of the analysis, they showed that in fact there was almost, a, almost an 80% reduced risk of developing all cancers if you took that first year out of the mix. So what is the possible connection? Well, the possible connection has been the thinking that because active vitamin D inhibits cancer cell growth, it seemed to make sense. And that is, if you're exposed to a lot of sunlight or you ingest a lot of vitamin D, you would get your kidneys to activate more vitamin D, make this anti-cancer hormone that would then bathe all the tissues in your body to prevent you from developing a malignancy. The problem with that concept is that Activated vitamin D, for sure, will inhibit cancer cell growth. But no matter how much vitamin D you ingest, and no matter how much sun exposure you have, your kidneys will not make more active vitamin D. And the reason is simple, because the kidney makes active vitamin D for one purpose, and one purpose only, to maintain calcium metabolism and bone health. If you made too much active vitamin D in your kidneys, your calcium would go outside the normal range, it would become elevated, and ultimately it would lead to calcification of your kidneys, blood vessels, and could ultimately lead to death. So there had to be another explanation, and that was a real conundrum. So why is it that there's this association with living in higher latitudes, increased risk for vitamin D deficiency, and association with increased increased risk for colorectal cancer and ovarian cancer. That was a real conundrum. Until it was realized by many laboratories in the 1990s, including our own working with Dr. Schwartz, that many cells in the body not only have a vitamin D receptor, they have the machinery to activate vitamin D. Now you may say, well, if every cell in your body is activating vitamin D, if this was getting into your bloodstream, this would cause a major problem. Well, it turns out Mother Nature cleverly figured out what to do. So first, once the active form of vitamin D is made, it's controlling a whole host of genes, including controlling cell growth, reducing risk of cancer. And then it induces enzymes, machinery, to destroy itself. So it never gets out of the cell into the circulation. So clever of Mother Nature. So the kidneys activate vitamin D to regulate calcium and bone metabolism, but the local production of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D is to regulate a whole host of genes. And so the concept has been that, for example, the colon cell, that if you raised your blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D of greater than 30, but preferably 40 nanograms per ml and higher, that now you're providing enough substrate for the mitochondrial 1-hydroxylase to convert it to 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. Interacts with its receptor, 
and goes to the nucleus and then unlocks a whole host of genes to regulate cell cycle, to regulate differentiation and maturation, and if the cell can't control its own growth, it will induce its own death by apoptosis. It's estimated by some at least 200 and maybe as many 2,000 genes in the body are directly or indirectly regulated by the active form of vitamin D. What about the immune system? It's always been known that the immune system activates vitamin D. Macrophages, those cells that gobble up infectious diseases like tuberculosis, once they do that, they activate vitamin D. And the question is, why? As early as 1849, it was appreciated that cod liver oil and vitamin D protected against TB. This was in the early uh, 1920s and 30s. Finally, in 2006, Dr. Adams, Maudlin, and Dr. Liu made an interesting observation and reported it in science. And what they realized was that when you infect a macrophage with, say, a tuberculosis bacterium, one of the first things that gets turned on with the toll-like receptors is the gene that activates vitamin D. Now you may wonder why. Well, they went on to show that the reason is it tells the cell to increase the expression and production of cathalocidin. Turns out cathalocidin is what we call a defense in protein. It specifically interacts with the TB and kills it. So now we understand why the macrophage activates vitamin D. And we now also appreciate that vitamin D is a very important uh, factor in helping you to fight infectious diseases and to regulate your immune system. And that's probably why solariums were so popular back in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. It was used effectively in helping to treat tuberculosis. And it was also curious that if you lived above 5,000 feet altitude, you basically never would get TB. And we think we now know why, because above 5,000 feet altitude, there's essentially little ozone, so you constantly can make vitamin D throughout the year, even in the wintertime uh, in Northern Europe, in the Alps. But we also know about the flu season. And Dr. Cannell had published a very interesting paper because he had realized that Edgar Hope Simpson had suggested that there was a seasonal influence on the flu and that the flu always seems to occur at the end of the winter. And Hope Simpson realized that if you lived at the equator, that you would get the flu throughout the year. And so coldness per se does not activate the flu virus. There has to be some other seasonal stimulus. And Hope Simpson suggested that that possibility is something going on in the wintertime. Well, what goes on in the wintertime for sure is that you basically, if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, cannot make any vitamin D in your skin from November through February. And the further north and south you go, above and below that latitude, you make less and less vitamin D um, and that winter extension goes from about September until almost April. And so it's well documented, no matter where you are on this planet, that the highest blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D are at the end of the summer and the lowest are at the end of the winter, suggesting the possibility that infectious diseases occurring during the winter time may be associated with the fact that you're vitamin D deficient. Indeed, Sabeta had published a study out of Yale showing that healthy adults that had maintained a blood level of 25 hydroxy D, that magical number of about 40 nanograms per ml, reduced risk of upper respiratory tract infections by twofold. A study done in Japan showed school children taking 1,200 units of vitamin D a day during the wintertime reduce their risk of developing influenza A infection by 42 percent. Opponent had showed that children back in the 1960s in Finland who were getting 2,000 units of vitamin D a day had followed for 31 years, 
reduced their risk of getting type 1 diabetes by 88%. And the magical latitude of about 33 to 35 degrees, if you live above that latitude for the first 10 years of your life, you have a 100% increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis. And a study done out of the Nurses Health Study showed that women had the highest intake of vitamin D, reduced risk of multiple sclerosis, 41%. And a study done in Iowa showed women had the highest intake of vitamin D, reduced risk of rheumatoid arthritis, 44%. And a study done at the Framingham Heart study showed that if you're vitamin D deficient, you have a 50% higher risk of having a heart attack. So what about the mechanism? Well, we think that the mechanism has to do with, again, active form of vitamin D regulating a large number of genes, controlling both the formation of atherosclerotic plaque, inflammation, also controlling blood pressure by controlling renin production, and also playing a role in cardiomyocyte function. So the question is, what genes are being turned on and turned off? And has there ever been a study actually looking at healthy adults receiving vitamin D? And we know that if you're vitamin D deficient, you are at a higher risk for dying, and that many of these chronic illnesses that we talked about from cardiovascular mortality, for example, just by maintaining a blood level above 30 nanograms per ml, you reduce that risk of mortality by as much as 25 to 33 percent. So what about the genes and vitamin D? And so we did a study a year ago, and we asked a simple question, and that is, does your vitamin D status influence expression of your genes? And what better way to do that is to give healthy adults vitamin D. And we gave one group of adults 400 units for 12 weeks and another group 2,000 units of vitamin D. And we got their Buffy coat, which is basically the white blood cells in the blood. Now you may ask, why did we get white blood cells? Because it's the easiest way to be able to access uh, cells in the body that we could actually look at gene expression. And we did a chip analysis of over 22,500 genes. So we took the RNA from these white blood cells, processed it, put it on the chip, and did an analysis and looked at over 22,500 genes. Now, you may not be aware exactly of what gene expression heat map is, so I'll just review that with you briefly. And that is, it's basically to stack up all of the genes that are being influenced by whatever it is that you're looking at. And in this case, was vitamin D. And the blue and the white is indicating that this particular gene, each one of those lines is a gene, is, being, uh, is, is not very active, that it's a very low expression. Whereas, if you have the gene in kind of this orange and red coloration, all of those lines mean that those genes are being now highly expressed. So with that, we looked at a heat map for our subjects that received vitamin D. And we found that 82 genes at baseline, before we gave anyone any supplementation, right, had high expression. You can see all the kind of red and orange and a little bit of white and blue. And giving them vitamin D, we were able to show significant decrease in the expression of those 82 genes. Similarly, when we looked at the group of genes that had low expression, those that received vitamin D supplementation had a dramatic effect on increasing the expression of those genes. Also, what's curious when you look at this is that if you begin to look at the before supplementation and look at the group that's at 27 up on the top here in the pink area and look at those genes, they're a little bit red and orange and blue compared to the group that are at 16 nanograms per ml where most of them are deep red. So you could even tell based on these data 
that your vitamin D status at baseline seemed to be influencing these genes. And the same was true after they received vitamin D supplementation. So ultimately we identified 291 genes being influenced just by giving vitamin D. And so here's just a, a better look at it. You can see again on the left side that the group that was at 27 and these genes are not as expressed as the group that was vitamin D deficient where most of these individuals, each one of these bar uh, lines here is an individual uh, uh, subject. You could see that there's a big difference whether you're at 27 versus 16. 82 of these genes, like I said, seem to be influenced by vitamin D because when they did receive vitamin D, that we're able to show that all of them increased their, uh, I'm sorry, all of them decreased their expression. And what's curious is that we showed that giving vitamin D supplementation, this group increased from 27 to 35 and the group at 16 increased to 25. But the bottom line is that no matter what your vitamin D status, getting additional vitamin D appeared to have a significant influence on decreasing the expression of these genes, 82 of them, in a statistically significant way. Of the 209 genes that had decreased expression, and again, you could see very nicely that this group here that's vitamin D deficient, that they are markedly suppressed compared to the group that's at 27. You could see that at least the genes are kind of a little bit turned on. But when we gave vitamin D, all of them showed a significant improvement in expression of these genes. So 209 genes that were not very active, just giving these subjects for three months vitamin D supplementation had a dramatic effect. And so the question is, of course, what are these genes? And Dr. Arash Hossein in our lab did a very careful analysis of the gene bank. And not to bore you with the details, but each of these represent a gene. And some of these genes are responsible for transcriptional regulation. So they regulate directly gene activity. And that means that they could be regulating gene activity for cell proliferation, for differentiation, for an immune response, for cytokine production, etc. What we also found was that it regulates some genes that may be related to how you deal with stress. And DNA repair due to stress. Say if you're exposed to sunlight and you have what is called free radical formation that can damage your skin and increase risk of cancer. We found at least in these white blood cells that these genes are being influenced in a positive way by improving DNA repair. We also showed that we had alteration in some genes that regulated immune response and induce apoptosis. Again, consistent with the concept that if vitamin D through its active form can control cell growth, then it induces its own destruction. And also, we found a variety of genes that are regulating metabolic processes. So the bottom line is that we have identified a large number of genes that heretofore had not been appreciated to be controlled simply by your vitamin D status. And also, some of these genes have some effect on epigenetic modification as well. So we estimate up to 80 pathways being influenced by vitamin D supplementation. The amount of subjects that we had was relatively small because we only had a limited amount of resources. It was more than $2,000 just to do in one subject before and after the gene ray analysis. But what we did find was an indication that those that took 2,000 units of vitamin D a day had a more substantial response than those that took 400 units a day. But what the data also show is that no matter how much vitamin D you take, 
that you will begin to improve gene expression. And so taking any is better than nothing, and taking at least 2,000 units of vitamin D a day probably can have the maximum desired effect on regulating these genes. And so when feeding your genes right, think about vitamin D. So that's why I've been urging everyone to be thinking about their vitamin D status, not just in children, not just in adults, but for everyone from birth until death. Vitamin D deficiency is a disease of neglect, and the simple reason is because we've lost our appreciation that the major source of vitamin D is from sun exposure. And like I said, and many of the other speakers have also echoed the same theme, vitamin D deficiency increases risk of many chronic illnesses. So you don't want to think about a normal level, right? When you go to your doctor, what you really want to do is to get above 40 nanograms per ml. And the problem with that is, is that how do you get there? Well, for every 100 units you ingest of vitamin D, you raise your blood level of about one nanogram per ml. So drinking a glass of milk with 100 units, you raise your blood level by one. If you eat salmon, wild-caught salmon, you could raise it by five, maybe by 10. That's the problem. Because most people, if they're not exposed to adequate sunlight or taking an adequate amount of vitamin D, Caucasians typically run at around 18 to 22 nanograms per ml in Boston. And African Americans who are at much higher risk because of their skin pigmentation and sunscreening effect are usually at around 13 to 15 nanograms per ml. And we showed several years ago, 1,000 units of vitamin D a day to healthy adults will not raise blood levels above 30 nanograms per ml. And we want you to get to 40 nanograms per ml. So at a minimum, adults should be taking two to 3,000 units of vitamin D a day, children 1,000 units of vitamin D a day. So you could be like they are. In Africa, we now know that people in the bush exposed to sunlight all the time are achieving blood levels of around 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. Evolutionarily, I think that's where we all need to be. Look at this, think about it. Disease burden of vitamin D deficiency, low birth weight, stunted growth, increased risk for type two diabetes, hypertension, risk of fracture, common cancers, autoimmune diseases and infectious diseases, just to name a few. Conquer D deficiency, best source? Well, the best source by far is sun exposure. And it turns out, of course, I'm constantly asked by the press and everyone, how long should I be outside to make enough vitamin D? And my answer, unfortunately, has been, depends upon time of day, season of the year, latitude, degree of skin pigmentation. Is it cloudy outside? What is your altitude? Well, the good news is that Rob Williams, who is founder and president of Ontometrics, developed an app called DMinder, and we've partnered together and putting a lot of the data that I've been collecting for 30 years around the world, looking at sun exposure and making vitamin D. He's taken that information and made it into a very functional app where you can take your iPad or iPod outside or iPhone and, and be able to um, know exactly how much UV index is coming in and relate it to your ability to make vitamin D in your skin. So you can go to dminder.info and if you have an iPad or an iPhone, you can download it and try it out for yourself. But I think that this will help in a major way in providing people with a sensible way of being able to make some vitamin D separate from taking a vitamin D supplement. What do I do? Follow my own advice. Sunscreen on face, but not on arms and legs. I like to cycle and play tennis and also garden. And I, like all my family members, take about 2,000 units of vitamin D a day, along with a multivitamin, so I'm getting about 3,000 units a day. My blood levels usually on average 50 to 60 nanograms per ml. I practice what I preach. So you don't need to be a genius <laughs> to know, right? That we need sensible sun and vitamin D supplement recommendations. This is not a hypothesis. 
preferred range by the Endocrine Society, the recommendation is 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, up to 100 is perfectly fine. So, Endocrine Practice Guidelines recommends for neonates for the first year of life, 400 to 1,000 units a day. For children, 600 to 1,000 units a day. And for adults, 1,500 to 2,000 units a day. And I think it's easier just to simply give children 1,000 units a day, adults two to 3,000 units a day. If you're obese, you need at least two to three times more. I recently wrote a new book called The Vitamin D Solution, and back there are also tables telling you anywhere on the globe, any time of the year, how much vitamin D you can make, and it fits in well with the app. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you very, very much, Dr. Hollick. Uh, we are going to alert people right now to the fact that next week uh, we will have, excuse me, Dr. John Cannell talking about vitamin D and the prevention and treatment of autism. And we would encourage you certainly to join in and listen to Dr. Cannell about that. And this very tragic situation with autism right now, it currently occurs in one of 50 newborn infants. That number has grotesquely increased over the years. So I encourage you to do that. At this point in time, those of you that need to leave, um, please do so. But we will also continue with Dr. Hollock in question answering and all of the the, both the lecture and the questions will be posted on the web for you to view uh, later today. So again, thank you for coming. And for those that can stay, let's take a look at our questions. Dr. Hollick, uh, number one, uh, I think you've already answered the question about what D levels are needed. But is there any true measure about maximal number of genes and expression as related to the blood level? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we, and the answer is we don't know. I mean, we did the study, you know, using 400, which at the time was what was the recommendation before the Institute of Medicine came out with its recommendation. And then we thought 2,000 was reasonable because that was the safe upper limit back in 2010 when we did this study before the Institute of Medicine said that it was actually 4,000. So right. we don't know. And we plan to do a study to give increasing doses if we can get funding and to see whether or not if you if we gave them 4,000, would that make a difference? Would you even increase more gene activity? And we just don't know. But clearly, our data show that taking at least 2,000 units a day has a dramatic effect on gene expression. Great. Question two, are low levels of vitamin D hereditary? They can be, but it's extremely, extremely rare. There's a rare genetic disorder that prevents the liver from converting vitamin D to 25-hydroxy vitamin D, but there's only a few reported cases in the world. Also, there are what are called vitamin D-dependent rickets type 1 and vitamin D-dependent rickets type 2, where they have either an inborn or acquired disorder in metabolizing 25-hydroxy D to 125D or they can't recognize 125D because there's a defect in the receptor. Otherwise, the answer is no. If you take adequate okay. calcium and vitamin D, you will improve your vitamin D status for sure. Okay. Uh, question number three, if your vitamin D is low and the genes change, do they go back to the way they were after you get your vitamin D level up? We think so, based on our data, because it looks as if your vitamin D status was related to the degree of gene expression. So we would anticipate that, yes, if you were vitamin D sufficient, that you would correct the expression of those genes. And if you became deficient, a lot of those genes would be either turned on or turned off in a negative way. And so I believe that the answer is yes. Okay. Which are the genes whose products were most related to vitamin D? It's a good question. Like I said, we found 291 genes. And so many of them, like I said, regulate uh, the immune system in various ways, regulate uh, DNA repair, regulate apoptosis, regulate uh, stress effects on um, the cell. So there's just a whole host of different genes that are related to vitamin D. And I think that the study now helps to give some mechanistic uh, ammunition for why vitamin D has been found to have so many health benefits. 
uh, I think you've answered this, but does this mean that D deficiency could, say, trigger autoimmunity in certain genetic makeups? We believe so. We think that the observations made by many investigators showing an association with increased risk for type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's disease, all autoimmune disorders, have been related to vitamin D deficiency. And animal models have shown that if you improve their vitamin D status or give them the active form of vitamin D, many of these uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, such as the, the one that's mimicked for multiple sclerosis called encephalitis in mice, is markedly reduced, as well as type 1 diabetes. Can vitamin D improve my immune function? We believe, based on our data, that by improving your vitamin D status will definitely improve your immune health. And it's definitely been shown that the macrophages that gobble up infectious agents like TB, if adequate 25-hydroxy vitamin D is around, it will take advantage of it, convert it to the active form of vitamin D, which then tells the cell to develop the machinery <coughs> to destroy the uh, infectious disease. So yes, it's very important. Dr. Hollick, would you take a look um, at the questions 7 through 12 and kind of answer them as a group? I think individually they, um, they actually sure. kind of fit together as a group. Yeah. I mean, there is evidence that leukemia, um, that, that uh, so early studies showed that possibly in some myeloproliferative disorders that active vitamin D potentially could help. The problem is that these cells then develop an immunity to the active form of vitamin D, so it's not been effective for treating the disorder. But there is some evidence that in um, non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphoma, that children having the most sun exposure, i.e. the highest vitamin D status, reduce their risk of developing um, some myeloproliferative disorders later in life. Vitamin D is critically important for your bone health and helps to maintain your bone density. I have most of my osteoporotic patients on adequate calcium vitamin D and often don't put them on a bone active drug and their bone density remains the same or in fact sometimes improves. In terms of the vitamin D story and arterial calcification, in my opinion, is way overplayed. Even this argument about if you're taking an adequate amount of calcium as recommended by the Institute of Medicine, you're at increased risk. I don't believe it. I think that if you look at the data carefully, that many of these studies are flawed in their interpretation. And in my opinion, there is no evidence that having adequate vitamin D on board and having the recommended amount of calcium supplementation and it coming from your diet is probably your best source will increase risk for arterial uh, calcification. Regarding hair growth, there are vitamin D receptors in the hair follicle and, and this rare genetic disorder called vitamin D dependent rickets type 2 or called vitamin D resistant rickets, they have alopecia and there's been some animal studies to show that vitamin D may have some minor role to play in regulating hair growth. But taking vitamin D, is that going to all of a sudden make bald men hairy again? I don't think so. <laughs> and what about vitamin D and gene expression and epigenetics? Like I said in that slide that I showed you, that yes, vitamin D definitely plays a role in genes that do regulate epigenetics. So it's a very important additional function, we think, of vitamin D. Thank you. Uh, I like this question, number 13. What does this mean for an aging population? Oh, well, I think what it means actually for the entire population is that we should have everyone improve their vitamin D status because I think that these data, even though it's in a relatively small group, um, pretty much demonstrate the, the dramatic effect that only three months worth of vitamin D has, a, has an effect on over 291 genes. And for aging population, they're at very high risk of infectious diseases, especially in nursing home settings. And so improving their vitamin D status could very well decrease their risk of infectious diseases. Number 14, 
it asks a question that I'm not quite sure you observed. Why do you think you didn't see a dose-dependent difference in gene expression? Yeah, as we said in our, our manuscript, the problem is, of course, like I said, it was very expensive to do the study, so we only could do it in a relatively small group. Even though there was a trend for a dose response, we didn't have a statistically significant difference because the number of subjects was too small. We need to do a okay. much larger study. Okay. Number 15, um, one of the things that we're seeing now in many scientific studies is that different diseases really take different serum levels in order to achieve their, their maximum prevention or if it's a disease thing or maximum enhancement. So the same question about genes. Is there an upper serum level limit where any increases would not add additional benefit to gene expression? Yeah, as I had mentioned at the conclusion of the presentation, that that's what we want to know the answer to. So sure. what we plan to do the study to now give higher doses and to see whether or not there are other genes being affected. We don't know the answer to the question. It's a very good one. Right. Can you tell number 16 if there's any difference between vitamin D ingested versus sunlight regarding effects on gene expression? Yeah, we don't know the answer to that. We suspect that there may be a difference. Uh, we have some evidence that when you make vitamin D in your skin, of course, you're making lots of other things as well, and that these may have additional benefits. Okay. Um, regarding the inhibition and versus expression of genes in relation to vitamin D, um, the expression of some genes result in positive health factors and some in unwanted diseases. Did you notice that vitamin D's overall action was to change gene expression to result in overall improvements in health? Well, when we looked at the genes, many of them we felt that were turned off were genes that may have a negative effect on your health. And the genes that we turned on had a positive benefit for your health. But obviously, this three-month study, we're not going to be able to see any significant health outcomes in that short period of time. Okay. Uh, number 19, do you think maintaining healthy levels of vitamin D before and during pregnancy could reduce the chances of passing genetic diseases on to our children? It's a very good question. I mean, there's a lot of evidence now that just the environment that the fetus is developing in can have a dramatic influence, an epigenetic influence on them that could stay with them for the rest of their lives. And there is mounting evidence that vitamin D may play a very important role in regulating genes for the immune system or genes regulating the epigenetic activity that could very well impact on the health and welfare of the developing fetus throughout the life of that individual. Mm -hmm. I have heard that illness, stress, and some environmental factors can turn genes on. Uh, can vitamin D help prevent this? I think you've answered this, but Exactly. Again? Yep. And so this is basically an epigenetics that is factors that influence gene expression, either by methylation, for example, of DNA or other ways of, of controlling histones and, and the like. And we think, based on our data, that vitamin D does influence some of the genes that regulate the epigenetics. Dr. Hollick, would you please explain what epigenetics is? Yeah. What epigenetics means is that you have a certain gene sequence, and those genes are responsible for um, the activities um, that occur in your body. But if you're now exposed to an environmental factor that now has an influence on the expression of that gene above and beyond what it would normally be, that's basically considered to be an epigenetic factor. So it's something that is not regulated by your genetic makeup, but rather something that can alter the expression of genes that have been programmed by your genetic makeup. Thank you. Um, your study looked at gene expression in white blood cells. Why white blood cells? How does gene expression in white blood cells compare to gene expression in all other cells? Yeah, as I mentioned early on, is that the easiest way to get DNA and RNA from people is to just simply collect blood rather than trying to take a huge skin biopsy or to 
or to take out a piece of intestine or a hunk of your heart. I mean, all of those would be great, but are really not very doable. It was just very easy access, and and it was just asking a simple question because we knew that activated T and B and lymphocytes have a vitamin D receptor. Macrophages activate vitamin D, so it seemed to be the perfect place to start this type of genetic expression analysis. Thank you. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, I think that what are the next steps, number 24, what are the next steps in research regarding vitamin D and gene expression? What do you see as the really key next things? Well, I think that there are a lot. For, first, for example, we don't know if ethnicity makes a difference. So, for example, do blacks respond differently? Um, you know, there's some evidence that they may respond differently to their parathyroid hormone and bone health because we know that African Americans typically have a much higher bone density genetically than do whites. What about the amount of vitamin D? We don't know. What is the maximum amount of vitamin D to give you the maximum expression of genes or to reduce expression of genes all for the purpose of improving your health? The amount of vitamin D for a child and an adult. Will it make any difference? Are the genes different expressed in children when they're getting vitamin D supplementation compared to adults? These are just a few of the questions that um, I think can now come from this fundamental study that we have recently published on the subject. Enough research to keep you busy for a few more years, do you think? I am hoping so. <laughs> and uh, are you coming out with a new book? Um, I may be coming out with a new book, but I think probably the more important um, new uh, innovation is what Rob Williams now has from uh, Ontometrics, which is the app that specifically can help guide you for how much sun exposure you require to satisfy your body's vitamin D requirement. And that is essential to absolutely everybody. Again, I thank you, Dr. Hollick, so much for an absolutely excellent uh, talk and answering our questions of our participants that are listening. Uh, we welcome all of you to come again next week to listen to Dr. Connell talk about vitamin D and the prevention and treatment of autism. And by the way, much of Dr. Connell's focus with autism is in that prenatal environment. Uh, and I encourage uh, those of you who are listening to download the article to read again about that, um, that environment. Thank you again, and Dr. Hollick, again, thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. It was my pleasure. All right. Have a delightful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.